This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. What happens when fed up citizens turn an engineer loose on the political swamp? Well, we're going to find out today because the author of the book, Wrestling Gators, Patrick Kolbeck, is with us. And he was a senator in the state of Michigan, the first one elected without any political experience at all. That is amazing. <laughs> How do you do that? <laughs> well, uh, actually, you don't do that. You, you put yourself on your knees and you let God uh, open the doors. Does God call you to something like that? Because you had no experience in city government, uh, hadn't been a, in the House of Representatives. You went right to the Senate. Uh, yeah. you, did you feel called to that at the time or pushed a into it in some way? Absolutely. I mean, there's. let me put it this way. Engineers aren't known for their uh, being extroverts. Yeah. <laughs> so the whole idea that I'd be going off and knocking on 6,000 doors, I mean, there was a purpose to it. There was a calling to it. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, we felt at peace going off and doing this um, for quite a few years before then. My wife and I had been kind of waking up to our faith and the fact that we should be doing more than just cranking numbers and spreadsheets. <laughs> um, and... Uh, and this is one of those areas where we started getting more politically active back in the 20, uh, 2009 time frame, mm -hmm. back when the Tea Party got started up. Yeah. And we actually went to our first uh, political event ever. It was actually the Tea Party rally on April 15, 2009. Met a whole bunch of folks there, started getting plugged into different events, started going to office hours. And, um, you know, next thing you knew, um, we were actually uh, being called to actually go off and run after attending a office hour for a gentleman that was going to be running for the position I eventually ran for. Oh. And uh, the guy lied to us. We had done our homework beforehand. And I go, man, anybody that can lie this easily, I don't want them representing me mm -hmm. up in Lansing. And so we went off, prayed about it. They've got a deadline because <laughs> we want to be very specific. And uh, deadline was February 21st. And that morning, our, our, my devotion read uh, from 1 Corinthians 9, 24, for many run in the race, but only one gets surprised. <laughs> Uh, run in such right. ways to get the prize, yeah. and that's exactly what we did, and that's what kept me out there knocking doors from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. every single day, did except you, for Sunday. Did you go into this with your eyes wide open, or is it better off to be a little bit uninformed about what, what really happens in politics? Well, actually, my background's in management consulting, so I mean, I'm used to dealing with people and uh, understanding that I'm, I'm not the one who can always make the final decision about how we proceed on things, but... Uh, you have to influence people to go off and see things your way, and you're always dealing with different characters in that kind of environment. So uh, politics, frankly, it wasn't a heck of a lot different from management consulting. And frankly, my first exposure to politics was on church council anyway, so I was, I was well equipped from that. But you know, normally when you're doing a uh, negotiation in a business sense, you've got two sides to the negotiation. You're going yeah. into a two-party system, but you're not extremely popular with either side of that. Yeah, it's kind of one party system. It's kind of a state party, if you will. Um, there's, sometimes there's not a heck of a lot of difference between how Republicans and Democrats act. Now, I think there's significant difference in their platforms and what they say that they believe in. But from what I've observed in actions, um, sometimes there's not a heck of a lot of difference, unfortunately. It, but you're going into a into a Senate and into a, a that really both sides of this were not in favor of what you were doing. How do you keep from getting uh, sucked up into that and becoming something that you didn't run on? I mean, somebody asked you actually after you got elected that now that you've been elected, how are you going to keep from becoming part of the problem rather than part of the solution? How did you yeah, do well, that? We put, yeah, well, we put down a little uh, a set of guidelines for me on every um, bill that came before me. I put together something I called the compass. It was my mm -hmm. voter compass. And so I would always stay calibrated on what I told the voters I would do. I wrote these principles down. I had some simple uh, um, questions I would ask myself before every bill came up before us or before I pursued any given policy. Like, is it constitutional? Will it make it, um, uh, is it applied equally to everybody in the state? Which is something that is probably one of the more uh, commonly abridged uh, um, elements of our Michigan Constitution mm -hmm. with the laws that are passed because... Uh, they always seem to favor one group or another. And so, and one of the, my favorites, I guess, is it easy enough for an eighth grader to understand. That's a good and, one. Uh, yeah, because yeah. there's a lot of, lot of laws that get passed that are deliberately setting it up so that you can't interpret whether or not you're following the law or not. And Stalin had a nice little expression uh, back when he was in power in the Soviet Union. He said, you show me the man, I'll show you the crime. Well, when you make the laws so complex mm -hmm. and so voluminous, 
that you can't figure out whether or not you're even following the law, you know you're in trouble. Right. Well, one of the chapters I haven't gotten to yet in the book is what happens, and I, this is this is a tough. One. What happens when one upsets the swamp because you're looking at draining the swamp, and the swamp's been there for a long time. What happens, and what kind of repercussions do you get when you're upsetting the apple cart and you're not well, a popular person? It is not pleasant. I mean, just a little bit of background first. When I during my first term in office. I was elected to the Senate leadership team. Uh, I was our assistant caucus uh, chair, mm -hmm. and um, I served as the chair of the Department of Military and Veterans Affairs and, Mil and Michigan State Police budgets. Um, and during that time frame, we turned, we converted all those budgets into performance-based budgets. That we were like one of the last states when it came to veteran services. By the time I was done with my four, or four years there, we were number two in veteran services. And we had uh, eliminated uh, three out of the top, out of our four um, cities that were on the top ten crime list in the in the uh, in the whole country. Um, so we had serious improvements. Now you'd think coming out of that, when you yeah. start your second term, they'd be looking for you to go off and take on additional responsibility. Yeah, but certainly, that's not what happened because see, during that first term, and mind you, uh, we have a Republican majority. It's a super majority in the Michigan Senate. We, in the first term, we had 26 Republican senators out of 38 senators. That's called a super majority. In the second term, we had another super majority of 27 senators. And um, and I, uh, it, it is a you'd think that we had Republican Senate, we had a Republican House, we had a Republican governor. Yet during that first term, we passed Medicaid expansion. We passed taxes on, on senior pensions. Uh, we passed increased taxes for uh, gas taxes for roads. And uh, I was pretty vocal in opposition mm -hmm. to those policies. And I was also vocal in opposition to something called Common Core around education. Um, and I, I thought that was a top-down control of our education system. And I thought there was a lot of danger associated with that. Um, by the way, all the positions that uh, I had, I was on the side of the Republican platform yeah, and Republican it's, Party. It sounds I like opposed, a Republican platform. Yeah, I exposed. I I I, uh, I opposed the expansion of Obamacare, known as Medicaid expansion. I opposed Common Core, all, and I opposed all these tax increases unless there there's nothing else possible to go off and keep the government afloat, and that wasn't the case. And so when I came back from my second term, I found out. Via the press, by the way, not via the new incoming Senate Majority Leader, who I actually did vote for, found out via the press that I was the only returning senator, including a bunch of freshmen that were starting for the first time, that did not get any chairmanships. And I thought that was kind of strange. Yeah, it doesn't sound right. Yeah, so I texted the Senate Majority Leader, and I said, well, what do you mean? I, I, what, is this true? I didn't get any uh, chairmanships? And he goes, yeah, you didn't earn it. Uh. I go, Really? I mean, I just talked to you about some of the accomplishments we had mm -hmm. as chair. I mean, I can go into I mean, right to work itself sure. was a bit of an accomplishment. Um, and leading that effort took a lot of effort. But uh, he said I didn't earn it. And I go, well, you know, we're going to have to have a little bit of a meeting. And I got to dig into this. And, you know, I sat down with him and tried to understand exactly what he meant by you didn't earn this. And he said, number one, you were too vocal in your opposition to Medicaid expansion. Um, by the way, I was on the Republican side of that. <laughs> Number two, I was too vocal in my opposition to Common Core. Um, number three, said I underperformed in my district. And I just for background, I was one of two state level um, legislators that was targeted by the National Democratic Party. <laughs> so they obviously saw a threat with me um, in that position. And the, the fourth um, example he said was that I need to talk at more of an eighth grade level to my colleagues. So uh. those were the reasons that he gave for not a not granting me a wow. chairmanship and. I, I go, you know, this is a case where I, I was not mean to anybody. I did not target anybody, put pejoratives towards any of my colleagues. But I hit the policies with both barrels. Mm -hmm. And this is about um, freedom of speech. It's about representing the people that put you into office. And um, later on, I had a little discussion with the Senate Majority Leader. And he um, he made it clear. I mean, that's where the personalities come in. And when we talk about wrestling gators, yeah. he's a prime example of one of those gators that bites inside the swamp. But uh, later on in the session, he actually uh, challenged me to a gun duel oh. and pulled out his gun in the middle of caucus. And, and just to show you the dynamics and the power that's wielded by a Senate majority leader, not one person stood up and said that that's something that should not be done. So Wow. That, this a, is, a real, a real get, gun? A, oh, yeah. <laughs> It's a, he brandished his firearm and then challenged me to a duel um, wow. in front of 25 of my colleagues. And, and so this is a case where 
and I'm, I'm not a, I, I don't throw bombs at people. I mean, yeah. this is just about being persistent. We had a disagreement on policy. Ironically, it was gun control policy. I was on the side of the Second Amendment, just for references. And, um, and, and so, but this is how disagreements are, are treated in today's amazing. society. We're not able to have a logical debate. It's like my way or the highway. And I just, oh. I've, I've never been uh, born and bred to roll that way. If, if you were to flip the tables on that and you would have pulled a gun on him, you'd, you'd probably still be fighting a legal suit. Oh, no, I, it'd be horrible. I'd, I'd probably be eating uh, bread and water yeah. <laughs> behind bars right now. But Patrick, thank you for the book. It's, it's uh, an outsider's guide, and you were an outsider, to draining the swamp, wrestling gators, Patrick Kolbeck. Where can they get the book? Uh, you can go up on Amazon. It's probably the best way of getting it. And if you want to check into some of the policies that are outlined in there, probably the best way to um, get plugged in is just go to morninginmichigan.com. It also contains a link specifically to the page in Amazon where you can get that. I really want people to understand how government works on the inside with this book so that they can be more effective in their advocacy. With social media, no one can be neutral about any topic. From racism to trade in China, our nation has become instantly offended when we hear someone with a different opinion other than ours. To get some insight on how the Bible looks at this, I spoke with Bishop Kyle Searcy from his church in Montgomery, Alabama. Hey, something we see... Uh in the news a lot, it's all over social media, and it's the, uh, the quick labeling of, of people who dis you disagree with as being hateful or spiteful, or if, if I don't agree with you, then, then what you're saying is hate language. Is that just for today, or do you see that growing uh, across the nation? Unfortunately, I do believe it's growing, Bob. Um, social media is a wonderful platform. It gives us the ability to know what's going on in the world, it's increased globalism. It's increased our ability to really be connected. But there are some aspects of it that are somewhat different. I often think about growing up in my neighborhood when somebody uh, would say something about you, there was enough proximity for you to go to them and say, well, say that to my face. I don't know if you remember that. Say that right to my there, face. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you know, social media gives you the ability to say whatever you want to say in the privacy of your home or on your cell phone. Uh, and you don't have to face the individual with the exception of possibly being unfriended. Yes, that will really ruin my world. So it's given us the ability to be vocal and it's given us the ability to take on other people's offenses that may not even be our issue. You know, somebody in uh, Shukamu, Mississippi or, you know, somewhere across the world can experience something that all of a sudden we begin to take on angst and anger based on something that happened to someone else that we don't even know never met, so it creates a, a great deal of mob psychology. And I believe all of that together is beginning to build and create a climate where people are beginning to put these easy labels on things and uh, the issues are more complex than the easy labels. And one of those labels is uh, that aspect of hate. Do you think that uh, the, the taking up of, of somebody else's offense, uh, you, you, you grab hold of that offense, it's not yours, you see some injustice, maybe a, a, a true injustice, and you take it up, you think that's kind of assuaging my own guilt, I'll take up their offense and I can be, I can, I can be angry about that, but it sets aside my own guilt for maybe doing that same thing to somebody at some other time in my life. Well, it can be. Yeah, it certainly can be. You know, uh, the scripture says, physician, heal thyself. Uh, Jesus, when a woman was caught in the act of adultery, said, he does without sin cast the first stone. And I think that oftentimes we don't look inward uh, instead, we look outward and it really is easy for us to and it goes both ways. We could see somebody mistreated and it could bring up the pain of our own mistreatment and injustice. And at the same time, we could actually take somebody's burden. It could cover up our uh, our guilt in doing that to someone else. In, in today's society, uh, when we look at what's going on right now, is some of that legitimate? I mean, we see a, we've seen a lot of injustice. We've seen a lot of racial hatred, we've seen a lot of, 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 of just hatred between regions and different kinds of social injustice. Is some of it legitimate and then it grows from that? You know, I, I'm gonna crack a little joke here. Uh, I, I, don't know that that's, I don't know that that's a legitimate question. No, I, I don't really mean that, that's really a joke. Uh, the, 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 the way I mean that is, I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. How much of the world do we spend time trying to change and how much of the world do we learn to ride with and point it in a, in a better direction? And it, it, it just kind of is, you know, uh, again, social media gives us the ability for a lot more of what people are thinking and feeling to begin to be manifest. But 
a microscope is not wrong. Um, read a story years ago about a guy who looked at something in a microscope and didn't like what he saw, so he picked up the microscope and threw it across the room and broke it. Well, that didn't change anything. So what, what social media is doing is amplifying what is, and, and since it is, what needs to happen? And I think what needs to happen is, is the, uh, again, uh, I, I'm quite prejudiced in this, but I'm blatantly prejudiced in this, and I'll admit my prejudice in this, the gospel is the answer to the world's problems. Jesus, his teaching, his love, and what he recommends is the answer to the world's problems. As we see this, I think instead of getting deeply involved in the political debates and the ideology of it, and trying to reform certain aspects of society, our number one goal should be to get the gospel into the hearts of people, get society looking more like a true biblical society, and that, in a sense, will begin to shift, whether it's the, the hate culture or social media, whatever may be going on, we have to go back to the foundational answer of that question. Everybody will not embrace the gospel, but history proves out societies that have a Judeo-Christian ethic, mindset, morality, tend to fare better in every area of society. People who decide to honor the Ten Commandments and live by the Ten Commandments, those societies are a lot better in every respect and every aspect. So I think we have a responsibility to light the light, not take a light and put it under a bushel, not get uh, absorbed into darkness, but to actually light a light, be that city on a hill, and begin to manifest the nature and the culture that Jesus brought us in this earth. Is it easier for me as I'm sitting in the pew though, to get all excited and upset and, and challenge somebody who's a thousand miles away for their, for their injustice than it is for me to walk out the door and, and try to make true justice happen in my neighborhood. Now you spoke a mouthful there, Bob, absolutely. Uh, it is a lot easier and we, we need to understand that expressing your opinion is not the same as, uh, as the great commission and the great commandment. You know, going therefore to reach, teach all nations is not the same as expressing your opinion on social media. So yeah, it is easy and it is easy for people to think they made some contribution because they were empathetic towards somebody experiencing injustice or, or, or had a, uh, here's what happens a lot these days, uh, a conversation. Uh, we we want to have a conversation about what's going on. Well, conversations may expose people to a few, few different uh, ways of thinking about things, but conversations don't generally change the world. Action changes the world. And again, I can't think of any better action than us being who Jesus called us to be, and that's agents of light. Now in our second season, Viewpoint is hitting more topics head on than ever this year. Every Viewpoint program is produced without any commercial advertising, but we couldn't do this show without the support of our financial partners, and it only takes a minute to give. Go to WTLW.com and click Get Involved, then Donate. Your gift of $20, $50, or even $100 will help continue the outreach of TV44's Viewpoint program to impact your hometown and the world. The battle for the hearts and minds of our next generation continues. This year, researchers have found suicides in the U.S. are up 33% since 1999. In fact, it's at its highest since World War II. While many are trying to find answers to why we're losing so many to suicide every month, I wanted to find out more about how churches are dealing with the aftermath of a suicide. So I'm turning to a frequent guest on Viewpoint, Pastor Daniel Fusco of Crossroads Community Church in Vancouver, Washington. Hey, one, one statistic I want to talk to you about, uh, and I'm, I'm sure it's probably just as prevalent on the West Coast as is the East Coast and these flyover states, but it, the second leading cause of death of 10-year-olds to 24-year-olds now is suicide. Uh, it, it just seems like it's, it's, it's growing all the time. It's, it's doubled since, 19, I think, 2008 to 2015, it doubled. And uh, it's almost epidemic proportions here. And what's it doing out there? You know, same thing. It's that uh, uh, childhood, young people committing suicide is at an epidemic proportion uh, where I live in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, it, it, unfortunately, there's not a, you know, a season that goes by that we are not uh, grieving. Uh, the loss of a, a younger person to uh, self-inflicted, uh, you know, uh, suicide, de you know, death by suicide, and so it's a, it's a, it's a horrible situation that we're seeing in our young people. I read that that this is the Gen, Gen Z, Generation Z, the most connected generation ever. I mean, they've you go on Facebook and these kids have hundreds of friends. They're they're well connected on with their all their social media. Yeah, I'm not sure they're walking home from school with anybody, but they got a lot of friends on the internet. 
and yet they're, they're, they're saying that they're the loneliest generation ever, even though they've got all of these online friends. Do you think that's part of it? Well, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of factors to it, but I do believe, you know, I, I like social media like the next person, but there's, there's, there is a way that you can be uh, super connected but feel completely alone because ultimately for all of us, you know, none, nobody feels truly uh, united just to other people. God didn't create us just to have interpersonal relationships. He created us first to have a spiritual relationship with Him. You know, Jesus said, and lo, I'm with you always, even into the end of the age. And, you know, we read in the Old Testament where God says, you know, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And so there's nothing worse than having tons of friends, tons of followers, tons of people who like your pictures, but still feeling completely alone in the world. But that is part, unfortunately, of the human condition uh, as it exists today. And, and where that happens, it, you know, unfortunately, hopelessness, be, you know, comes quickly on the heels of these things. You think young, young people are, are desperate for that connection that they only receive in Jesus Christ? Uh, absolutely. I mean, the Bible teaches in the book of Ecclesiastes that God has placed eternity in all of our hearts. And so I remember as a young person, you know, not in this generation, you know, I'm, I'm in my uh, early 40s now, but I remember as a young person being popular, having tons of friends. This was before social media. I remember, you know, I remember this was before we had cell phones in our pockets. I, I, I remember times of have, being surrounded by all my friends and feeling completely alone. And only later did I realize cause I didn't grow up in a in a, in a Christian home, only later that I realized that I was longing for, to, to know who I truly was, to have my purpose defined for me, not by my peer group or by my parents, but, but by the Lord, by the God who created and sustained me. So I know for me, I came to know Jesus at 21. That was absolutely pivotal uh, for me because it absolutely changes the way I saw everything. So yes, I think every gender, and even right now, you know, let alone the young people, I think even in the older generations, I mean, the boomers uh, need Jesus as much as any other generation right now. And so I think without it, we're, we're left trying to figure out how to build an identity uh, without the essential component of who we truly are, which is Jesus himself. Well, one thing we're seeing is that uh, if, if a, a student in a school commits suicide, then all of a sudden the administration and the parents are panicking, is there going to be another one and another one and another one, even in that same school? And they're saying things like, I, I did not see this coming. I didn't see the signs. What should I have been looking for? Yeah, and, and that's really unfortunate because I think in a social media world, I mean, nobody ever puts their worst pictures on social media. Nobody ever goes onto LinkedIn if you're older and, and puts like, well, I got fired from this job because I was a lousy employee. It's like you make it sound a certain way. And so we're, we're, we live in a day and age where, where life is airbrushed, where, where everything is looking perfect. And almost none of us, like nobody sends out their, their, their Christmas card with their family on it where everyone just has a, a horrible face on it, right? And so uh, people have learned the art of being able to put on a mask but deep inside um, not being not being real or not feeling comfortable or feeling so much shame that they don't share it and that's why I think the church you know it's so important for the for the people of God to be salt and light in within their communities like the, you know sometimes we have a tendency to wait till someone's in such a bad spot that they reach out to the church when we I think the church God designed us to be proactively in our schools in our community our youth pastors and our youth leaders should be in the community building those relationships and trying to create safe and environments that draws people out so that they can be able to share, look, I'm really struggling in this area. I'm really, I'm really hurting in this area. And I think not only the church being the front lines, but also the church being the front lines, also inviting medical professionals and families into these discussions. Because I think for a lot of kids, they don't feel they, they can talk to anyone. Their parents are focused on certain things. Maybe uh, their teachers are focused on other things. They, they, they feel overwhelmed. They feel like they, they're never going to do it well enough. And so I think, you know, we want uh, the church, we want uh, families, and we want medical professionals to get involved because you realize that the desire to end your own life goes against every impulse that we are created with as human beings. Do you think the parents are intimidated by that, though, that, they, that they're almost afraid to look behind the screen? Um, so that, that's a great question. And, and I think for oftentimes, like, we, we, we want to believe that our kids are doing well. I think inherently, like as a parent of three kids, you know, part of what you're doing, you look at yourself and you say, you know, I hope I'm doing a good job. And, and, and when they're struggling, we have a tendency to maybe look over that and say, oh, maybe it's not that bad. You know, and so I, I know for me as a parent, one of my goals 
uh, is to be able to have a great relationship with my kids can tell me anything. They can tell me the good stuff and the bad stuff. And, and, and my bride, Lynn, and I have worked really hard to cultivate that. Now as our, our oldest is in his early teenage years, we're seeing that we're grateful that we, we laid that foundation, but now we're hoping that that foundation is going to hold for us for the, you know, the next 10, 15 years as, as he moves his way you know, through adolescence and the teenage years into adulthood. And so I think we, we, we want to be able to open up those conversations. I think even being able to you know, talk to kids and saying, listen, you know, I was re I was watching this TV program and, and they were talking about the, the epidemic of suicide. And, you know, do you ever have those thoughts? And, and do, do your friends struggle with that? And is there anything that I need to know? And I think opening up, you know, making a safe space that we, we allow young people to be able to share their feelings, you know, to be able to have, to be heard, to be able to be loved, to be able to say, yeah, I remember my teenagers, that was hard years. You know, things were changing, I didn't know what was going on. All of those things are, 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 are better than not talking about it and then only realizing later that, you know, somebody was crying out for help but didn't even know how to say anything about it. How do you as a, as a pastor and how does a church respond to, to someone who's lost someone that way? Well, yeah. So, I mean, as a church, when that happens, and unfortunately we have had this happen, is, you know, we, we run a great ministry here at Crossroads called uh, Grief Share. Uh, and that's for people who've had losses in all different parts of their life. It's, it's kind of a nationally known ministry that we run here at Crossroads. You know, we also realize that when uh, somebody loses uh, especially specifically a parent, uh, a child to suicide, that, that it's going to take a lot more care than, uh, than just a nor than another situation. I mean, you know, as somebody, I lost my mother uh, some years ago and that was very hard, but, but as a child, you expect that, you know, at some point you lose your parents. But for parents, you know, uh, parents are not equipped to bury children. I always say that, that they're, you know, God knows what it's like to bury a child as uh, Jesus went to the cross and rose again. But, you know, it, it's, it's a messy journey and I think the people of God, the, the local church should be a part of that, walking people through that. And we, you know, as a church, unfortunately, we've had to walk people through it. We've seen the messes in the midst of that, the challenges. You know, we tell people it's okay not to be okay uh, in the midst of it. Uh, gr the grieving is a process and it's not a straight line process. And so I think a lot of times, uh, as a local church, we have to be careful not to want to just make things really easy, you know, and we want to make it as efficient as possible because sometimes walking someone through the stages of grief for the loss of a, of, of a child just takes time and it takes work. And so we just have to, we signed up for this as the people of God because Jesus doesn't give up on us on our messy days, doesn't say, well, listen, you've been grieving this too long, so you just have to get over it now. He's like, he just bears with us because, uh, you know, as we know, uh, the fruit of the Spirit is long-suffering, the definition of love in 1 Corinthians 13, love suffers long or some trailers, love is patient. And so I think God invites us into that if that happens in our church family or in our local community. You can find out more about today's guest on our website. And I want to let you know there are two great ways to help spread the word about the show. One, we'd appreciate your financial support as Viewpoint has no advertising. It's supported by you. The second, Log on to YouTube and find our Viewpoint interviews and like, subscribe, and share with your friends. The more people who like our YouTube videos, the better chance our gospel message can rise to the top of search engines and help others learn about the truth of the Bible. Thanks for joining us today. You can listen to the Viewpoint podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and anywhere you can listen to a podcast.